Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. Our scripture readings are from Leviticus 19, verses 1, 2, and 11 through 19, and then the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22 and through 38. Um, in Leviticus, we hear uh, one of the forms of the Ten Commandments. Um, goes through a little bit more detail than just the Ten Commandments, but um, all of the, the ten are there. Um, but one of the things it says in Leviticus 19 is, Thou shalt not stand by as thy brother's, as thy neighbor's blood is shed. Excuse me. So thou shalt not stand by as thy neighbor's blood is shed. And through this um, moral precept, uh, through this command of God, which is divinely revealed by God, you know, we have the natural law, um, things that we can come to know by human experience and and uh, by reason alone, but then we have what's called the revealed law, and a, a big section, of course, of the revealed law is the Ten Commandments. We believe that these have been revealed by God to Moses and then passed on faithfully, uh, not only through the Jewish people for thousands of years, but then also through um, Christ and his church. Remember, Christ said very clearly in the Gospel, I do not come to destroy the law, I come to rather perfect and fulfill. So Jesus does not do away with these moral precepts. Thou shalt not stand by as thy brother's blood is shed. What comes to mind first and foremost with this is abortion. You know, are we going to, um, you know, we have shed so much blood. Um, you know, millions of, of innocents um, have died in our land uh, through abortion, and, and this blood has been shed. Um, are we going to say that the unborn child is not our neighbor? You know, of course, we are to um, consider every person a neighbor. And so if we have a person in need, and if a person in need, if their blood is being shed, we have to say something. If um, This is why we defend the life of people. This is why we um, have self-defense. This is why we have police that defend us. This is why we have armies that defend us. Because we can't have people shedding the blood of, um, of our neighbors. And the unborn are our neighbor, the most vulnerable um, and, and the most defenseless of our neighbors. Then if we look a little bit at the Ten Commandments, I think it's important that there's the, the phrase, especially in Leviticus, that it says it a lot, thou shall not. And this is what we would call a, a negative precept. So we have positive things of what you should do, and the negative things of thou shall not, what should be, what is forbidden. And these things are forbidden no matter what in any case. For example, thou shall not kill. What we mean there is not self-defense. What we mean there is murder. You sh it is never, ever permissible to take the life of an innocent person. Thou shall not kill. Okay, that, that, is, that is never the case. And so it is what we would call in the church an intrinsic evil, all right? It's in, intrinsically evil. It's always wrong no matter what. So let's look at a few of these, what we would call negative precepts. Thou shall not commit idolatry. This is a negative precept. It is never okay to worship false gods, okay? Even if you are to be put in prison, if you don't worship a false god, okay, well then put me in prison. Even if you are to die or be fed to lions because you won't pinch incense to the emperor who, who feels like he has a divinity, then okay, feed me to lions or, um, or put me in the gladiator, whatever you need to do, or catch me on fire. But I will not, um, there is never a time where it's permissible to go against that. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Would there ever be a time to take the holy name of Jesus, or the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, any sacred name, would it ever be okay to speak the Lord's name in vain without meaning? Here we have the name, the holiness of God. Um, God can never be in vain, always intentionally and purposefully, all right? Um, we already talked about thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Is it ever, ever, ever permissible to commit adultery? No, it's not. This is an intrinsic evil. It's always wrong, no matter what. Um, and then the next two, um, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness. Sometimes there's some clarification that needs on this, you know, with, with thou shalt not bear false witness, um, thou shalt not lie. Sometimes, um, if there is a person that 
would misuse the truth, okay, and, and a common example of this is if Nazis uh, come to your, your house and you're hiding Jews in your attic and the Nazi soldier says, um, hey, do you have any Jews in here? And you say, oh, gosh, I can't lie to him. You know, I have to tell him the truth. I have Jews in here. You know, there, there is an exception in that case because the Nazi soldier, one, does not need to know that truth. And two, if they are given that truth by you, then they would do harm with that truth. So you got to be really careful with this one and can't take it too, too far. But the basic standard is, one, does the person asking it actually have a legitimate reason or authority to know the truth? And two, what would they do with that truth? Is it going to be, um, is it obligated for me to tell them? In the case of like, let's say a parent says, where were you to a child, to a teenager? The teenager is obligated to tell their parent because the parent is the authority. And so you do need to let authorities know um, the truth, whether it will be uh, of bad consequence or not to you. Um, the other one is thou shalt not steal. You know, we hear cases of, particularly, I have a, one of my heroes of mine is Bill Capon. He was a chaplain, a Catholic chaplain in uh, North Korea, and he was captured and in prison, and him and fellow soldiers were in a POW camp. Well, Emil Capon would go out each night, and he would steal food from uh, the communist. Now, did he break this law? He did not break this law because they were being deprived of the food, and the food that was there, he, he needed to get for, for the people. He wasn't stealing anything from the guards that would in detriment, put their life in detriment. He was, he was taking what should have been given to the soldiers in the first place, um, and he was preserving life. Um, so in that case, it was, it was something that was needed. Um, again, you know, we don't want to take these things, these exceptions too far um, because we can get into to really trouble with that morally, but just wanted to make that statement. And then, of course, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Also, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. Never, ever, ever uh, would there be, it be permissible to covet another person's spouse or covet another person's goods. You know, make plans and want so badly to have those things. Um, so remember that with the negative precepts that they are what we would call intrinsic evils. They're always wrong, no matter what, no exception. Um, then we have positive laws. Examples of positive laws are two. Um, keep holy the Sabbath. Would there ever be a time? Um, and these, these are not, um, these actually in a sense can be broken. Um, keep holy the Sabbath. When would we, for instance, n it, when would it be okay to not go to Mass? Well, if Mass was never offered. There have been countries where there are no priests, there are no bishops, and so people cannot go to Mass because no Mass is offered. Um, what if you're sick, you know, deathly ill, and you can't make it to Mass? What if you have no transportation and you can't get to Mass? So this is why the Church does not, or the Ten Commandments, this is not a um, uh, prohibited at all times. It's not what we would call an intrinsic evil. To miss mass isn't an intrinsic evil because there are some cases that are legitimate in which um, you would not be able to go to mass. And the other one is honor your father and mother. Um, would it, are there times in which you would have to dishonor your father and mother? Yes. If your father and mother ever asks you to go against God's law, then you can dishonor your father and mother. Uh, you do not have to obey um, under this commandment, we also have other authorities like your country. If your country were to ask you to disobey God's law, then you can dishonor your country, dishonor the authority. Um, all right, when we move into the gospel with John 10, uh, this is this is the for the Wednesday of Passion Week, and so things are getting very intense, and the church offers to us all the situations in which people are, are obstinate, just attacking Jesus and wanting him to be killed. And this is another example of that. Um, this is when they actually um, say that he has committed blasphemy. They ask him some questions and, and he says, you know, eventually they say, um, you, you being a man, thou being a man, makest thyself God. You're claiming to be God, which is blasphemy. And so, Jesus is talking about how he's one with the Father, and he and the Father are one. He 
he says that those that have been given to me, no man can take out of my hands. Uh, no one can take them out of my father's hands. The father and I are one. And so their response to this, the Pharisees and the Jews, this response to this is, you're, you being a man are making yourself into a God. And for that, we, we call you out. You're a blasphemy. You're, you're committing the crime of blasphemy. So this is why Jesus, again, um, it, this is why Jesus was killed, because he was committing uh, what they thought was the crime of blasphemy. Of course, when Jesus says that he is God, he is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. We say that he is Lord. We say that he was not lying. He was not crazy. He is Lord, and therefore he's God. And what we say, what he says goes, and we faithfully pass that on for we have for 2,000 years, and we will continue to, even if it means our death. Um, with this, I like this for two two reasons. I like this verse in John 10 for two reasons. One, it says Jesus promises us that anyone is in his hands. If we are in his hands, no one can take us out of his hands. That should be very reassuring for all of us that Satan cannot pull us out of God's hands. No other force on this earth can pull us out of God's hands. And Jesus will not drop us. Okay, so again, if we are in the hands of God, no force on this earth can take us from his hand. Satan cannot take us from his hand. And Jesus will not leave, Jesus will not throw us down. So it means the only way that we could get out of his hands would be for one reason. We leave his hand. Okay? He promises us to safeguard us. But he also will not take away our free will. If we do not want to be in his hand, he will not make us stay there. Um, so we need to remember this safeguard, but remember that we always have our free will and to use it accordingly. Um, another thing that, uh, this is another one of those verses though, if you're ever talking to someone that says that Jesus is not God, for instance, the Jehovah Witness, go to this verse, John 10, Go to the trial before the Sanhedrin. That's another one. Go to the part where he says, um, "Are you?" Where they say, "Are you greater than Abraham?" And he says, "Before Abraham was, I am." There are so many accounts, at least those three that I can think of off the top of my head, where Jesus specifically says, "I am God." And if you, if if maybe a Jehovah Witness or another person that doesn't believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ, if they don't want to take that for an answer, you know, just look at the response of his enemies. They are furious. They want to stone this man. Um, and they want to stone him, not because he's crazy and not because he's lying, but because or, or they, they want to stone him because they think he's lying. But he has claimed to be God. Um, and if Jesus has claimed to be God, we have to ask, is he lying? Is he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? Thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. Please take the time to visit linkedliturgy.com where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.